Um, hi, good afternoon. Thanks for sticking it out. I think there might be some people back there in the poster session. That's okay. You're taping this or something, aren't you? And you're putting out the, the, the slides, so it'll all be there. Um, I, you're closing today like you opened it um, by someone who doesn't do any kind of HIV research or support any HIV research. However, I hope I can convince you that the type of thing we're doing with the Human Microbiome Project is of benefit to this entire community. And that's because the Human Microbiome Project, funded by the NIH, was built from soup to nuts to be a community resource. And I want to try to call out some of the resources um, that are of value to this entire community here. You've already heard of some. I just want to kind of um, point out to you, during most of the talks, you heard about the use of Metaflan or pie crust or Chime. There's a poster out here, Nephili, which took a whole bunch of HMP tools and wrapped them to make them a, a more user-friendly um, set of tools. Um, even uh, uh, El Hannon this morning talked about the use of HMP data as a reference data set to compare against other data sets. So that's really the entire spirit of the Human Microbiome Project, is to create tools, protocols, data sets, name it, to really help uh, this research community. So let me, let me walk, that's my short talk, so let me just give you some more examples of, of what I mean by that. So if I hit this. So the first, the first way this is a community resource, first of all, we've been in business for about nine years. The program will wrap up in its 10th year anniversary next year. One way we built a resource is by creating a community. So I don't like this red. You don't like it either, right? So these are all of the investigators over these last 10 years, all the institutions uh, that include the investigators over the last 10 years that have been involved in the HMP. So the beauty of this is a instantly a research consortium was built. All these people are available to you as resources, as collaborators. They built many of the tools and reference data sets. So that's one way it's a resource. The other way is we conducted a series of cohort studies. And actually the HMP is really has been broken down into two phases. So let me describe it very briefly to you. I'm pretty sure you know about the first phase because it was the better known program. And the, really the large question was who's there? It was a case control study of a healthy court, a group of people, young people, uh, adult men and women, who were clinically verified to be free of disease across these five major body regions. They were sampled simultaneously across these five major body regions, and they couldn't take antibiotics, probiotics, immunomodulators. They couldn't bathe 24 hours before a sampling event, that kind of a thing. We also had a series of uh, healthy, uh, pardon me, disease disorder cohorts of skin, GI, oral, and urogenital, in which the question was the same thing, who's there? But the question was, is there a characteristic microbiome associated with those disease or disorders? And many of you um, have either used the data that came out of this, the, the, the uh, computational tools, the reference data, uh, data sets, and so on. But we went on in phase two, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to um, address the question, what are they doing? Because we recognize in many cases, and you probably know this from the literature already, that um, taxonomic makeup is not equal to the phenotype of the microbiome. We really need to know what they're doing. And of course, El Hannon made a much more eloquent case for really analyzing the functional properties of the microbiome. But uh, the, the recognition and the need to actually analyze the functional properties of the microbiome formed the basis of phase two, which we fondly call the integrative HMP or the IHMP. And the whole point behind this is to ask the question, what are they doing? Well, in order to do that, we, need, we realized we needed studies in which multiple multiomic properties need to be measured. So phase two is a somewhat smaller endeavor, but possibly far more complex, because we uh, support three model or exemplar human microbiome conditions, preterm birth and pregnancy, IVD dynamics, and a type 2 di uh, diabetes dynamics cohort. All of these are longitudinal studies all of them measure the biological properties of both the host and the microbiome over time. So gene expression proteins, protein profiles, metabolite profiles, and lots of other host and microbiome phenotype profiles. So three exemplar cohort studies, even if you don't care about preterm birth, even if you don't care about type 2 diabetes, even if you don't care about IVD, 
you're going to want to study these data because these are an amazingly rich data set um, that will let you ask questions in a kind of a um, in silico way, if you will, without actually setting up a cohort study for yourself. That's why this is a very valuable resource. Okay, but let me just give you, even if you can't visualize necessarily what I'm talking about, I just want to give you a couple examples of why these data sets are of use to you. Okay, so we know, uh, so, so let me just talk about uh, data mining, the, the uh, metagenomic data. So um, both phase one and phase two produce all kinds of metagenomic data, which really allows you do, to predict the metabolic pathways that might be present in that microbiome. And we know that, um, uh, that the microbes carry out all kinds of metabolic processes, so you can actually data mine the HMP metagenomic data to discover important molecules or pathways. I mean, we certainly know that the gut microbiome can play both direct and indirect roles, for example, in drug metabolism. And that we have lots of examples of the known roles of microbial metabolism for many classes of drugs. Um, some microbes increase the bioavailability of some drugs. Some microbes, uh, some, some microbes uh, decrease the bioavailability of other drugs. And in some cases, microbes, your gut microbiome can actually increase the toxicity of the, a, a drug that you're given by your doctor. So we already have lots of classic examples of the role of the gut microbiota in altering um, drugs that are, are given for a disease. Well, I want to give you just three quick examples. The beauty of this is these people were not funded by the HMP at all. We simply released the data, and they went in there, and they had their own hypotheses, and they evaluated um, the HMP metagenomic data to ask a couple of questions, okay? So they data mined the HMP metagenomic data. In this one example, uh, in which they were interested in the distribution, the prevalence of antibiotic resistant genes in different populations around the world. They took the, uh, I think I have this here, yep. They took uh, nine different um, cohort studies, the HMP being one, circled in, in red, and compared across these uh, large cohort studies the antibiotic prevalence, antibiotic resistance prevalence uh, in these gut microbiomes. And you can see that, for example, the Japanese have the lowest uh, antibiotic resistance load in their gut microbiomes, uh, whereas um, the, that's over here in turquoise, the Malawians have the highest, and you can see sort of the spectrum across different populations around the world. This analysis was done without anybody actually doing the sequencing themselves. They simply went into the data sets that are available and asked the question about the distribution of antibiotic resistant genes. Another nice, clean example up here is it's somewhat the polar opposite of this, is um, many are now interested in trying to discover novel antibiotics, right? Because we're running out of our arsenal of antibiotics. So where do we go? Well, we don't go to a coral reef. We don't go to the rainforest. You go to your gut and you analyze what types of antimicrobials are being made by the population populations of microbes that are living in our guts. So in this case, there's a very lovely study done to understand the distribution of novel antibiotics, and they utilized the um, HMP metagenomes. And in fact, they looked at multiple body sites because all of our microbiomes, whether on skin, in our mouths, um, in our GI tract, or, or in our urogenital systems, all make antimicrobials because they're using those antimicrobials um, to, to uh, combat each other and invading pathogens. So um, they looked at oral gut and vaginal microbiomes and found all manner of uh, novel antimicrobials. In many cases, they went ahead and did kind of classic molecular genetics, reverse engineered uh, these predicted products and tested them for actual active antimicrobial activity, and in all cases, they found it. And a third example of how you can utilize metagenomic data for your question is um, there's a lot of interest in the role of the gut microbiome in the gut-brain axis. And you know, we've heard the old throwaway line that 80% of the serotonin that your body sees is produced in your gut. Well, they went ahead and mined the uh, metagenomic data along with other data to show that something like 10% of the HMP gut microbiota appeared to synthesize another neurotransmitter tryptamine. tryptamine. And they went ahead and verified that that was actually active tryptamine. So those are just kind of quick snapshot ways that you can utilize the data that's being produced by the HMP, even though you're not necessarily studying the same system that they studied in the HMP. So let me quickly walk through the kinds of data that these three model study cohorts are conducting. The first one, the first IHMP project, is the dynamics of pregnancy and preterm birth. They're um, 
so the way the, all three charts are going to be the same, it's the subject makeup, so pregnant women and their neonates. Uh, they're sampling uh, the vaginal microbiome, the child's um, uh, gut microbiome through, through meconium and stool, and the mother's gut microbiome. And they're uh, collecting, of course, more samples than they're going to analyze for the HMP, but these are all the kinds of samples they're collecting. And the way this graphic is organized is everything in blue, baby blue, is a microbial property, everything in pink is a host property, and everything where they're combined means they're going to be collected for both host and microbiome, or we can't tease them apart, like for example, the global metabolome. We don't really know the sources and the interactions between the host and the microbiome. So you can see right away there's this huge suite of properties that are being analyzed, collected and analyzed right now in the uh, pregnancy and preterm birth study. In the dynamics of the IBD onset study, um, it's, uh, I don't remember the number of cohorts, but they have ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and, and healthy controls in their studies. And I should mention, all three studies also took advantage of already participating in a mul multiple different cohorts, so they've enriched their cohort for the HMP, so they're likely to see the onset of disease during the study period. So they've got the pre disease period, the frank disease period, and then perhaps in some cases um, remission. So um, all of these studies will have data for pre, during, and after. Same kind of coding, so blue is all the microbial properties, pink is all the host properties, and so on. Let me go one more time. And then there's a third model study, the dynamics of type 2 diabetes onset. This is a smaller cohort, but it includes people that um, are pre-diabetic based on your, what is it, HbA1a uh, 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 blood uh, signal, but they have these pre-diabetics in which they're tracking all these different properties, and all these data are going to be released in the next roughly year or so. Okay. Now, we published a paper in 2014 called, it's called a marker paper. It's kind of a legacy from the Human Genome Project. If you're, if you're mounting a big program in which you're going to release a lot of data, well, what you want is you want to alert the user community to the data. So we published a paper in, um, in 2014 in Cell Host and Microbe, and it's a marker paper basically describing all the data. Those three figures I just showed you came from the marker paper, and this is simply a summary, and I want to make a couple points about this. It's all the data I just mentioned, but it's collapsed down to the different data types. And this is not terribly legible, I apologize. But the point behind this is NIH investigators are required to deposit their data in public repositories. Well, that's actually causing a big problem because our NIH's repositories are not federated or linked. So you can just shoot off your data into different repositories, and unless someone sat down with you and described your study design, you'd never be able to reassemble all the data that was produced from any one study. Okay, so here's like eight different repositories where all these different data are going to go. And what we have is we have a data coordination center who has a couple of different and important jobs. One important job is um, the, the HMP DCC serves as a, uh, how should I say this, a, a sanctioned repository for all the data. So yeah, you can go to all the repositories and request the data and get it, but we've also um, uh, set up a DCC so that all of the HMP data, the tools, the pipelines, all the analytical walkthroughs are available in one tidy place, okay? Number two, um, the DCC during this phase is also playing a similar role as the previous phase in which um, there are now uniform, we have a uniform submission pipeline for all the different data types from the three studies which is being processed through the DCC so that we can have, use common software, common metadata standards. In other words, call like data with the same terms so that you can figure out if you want to be able to compare, let's say, uh, data from the IBD study with data from the type 2 diabetes study, you can be guaranteed that the cytokine data will have the same uh, name and the same units, so you can compare like with like. That turns out to be non-trivial. So we have a DCC which processes all these data and get deposited to the various repositories, okay? But even that isn't enough. 
Okay, if you want to make sense of a study in which multiple data types have been produced, you really need a much more organized framework for that. So the HMP investigators are also producing a microbiome multiomic framework in which the framework will link the three HMP studies and really provide the user community with study design, number of subjects, primary data, process data, you can read all these things, derived data like the community profiles, gene expression profiles, and so on. And basically, the entire phase two of HMP will be in one place. This will happen in the next maybe two years, something like that. But this is basically to, frankly, overcome uh, the limitations that all of our repositories are, are independent and siloed and aren't federated or linked. Okay. And there's yet one more thing that we're doing with the HMP. Um, you may or may not know that uh, about three years ago, the, we have a brand new office of the Associate Director for Data Science, and the idea is trying to find some way to take all NIH data and make them more user accessible and, and, and user friendly. And one idea is, is creating this NIH Data Commons, which is a cloud-based resource where you're not limited by server size at your institution. Um, all the data and their associated tools will be available so you can do analysis in the cloud or if you need to, download it to your local server. The, the, in order to test this idea, HM, uh, the, the, uh, the ADS office, Associate Director for Data Science, the ADS office has decided to use the HMP data and tools as a pilot test case for the NIH Commons. So that's a benefit to this community too because uh, within about a year, all phase one data and tools will be in the cloud roughly in the next year or so. And then um, phase two data, of course, will take longer because we're in the middle of phase two, but all phase two data and tools will be in the cloud in roughly next, let's say, three years, something like that. So an important feature and an important resource from the HMP is trying to find different ways to make the data available to the user community. Don't just say go deposit it in this repository, but go to the next level and, and think about ways we can make the data more useful. Let's see. And I don't know how I'm doing on time. I had a couple more things I wanted to say. Am I okay? Okay, good. That's why I had a little blank there. <clears throat> You know this, I'm sure, but the NIH is made up of 27 different institutes and centers. Okay, and when the HMP started, I think we did a little portfolio analysis in 2005 or 2006, and human microbiome research was being funded at a level of around five million per year by about four or so, five institutes, okay? Five years later, 2012, 2013, we're funding microbiome research at a level of about 100 to $150 million a year. And we went from four ICs to 18, okay? I saw that happening, I thought, oh my gosh, we have to start talking to each other. So in 2012, uh, we formed the Trans-NIH Microbiome Working Group, okay? It's all extramural staff like me, no intramural people, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, we meet once a month, and we have, it's a forum for all of us to talk through what we're doing, what we're supporting in the microbiome area in our institutes, okay? So we discuss gaps, needs, and challenges. We share upcoming funding opportunity announcements with each other. That's why intramural staff um, can't be on this uh, committee. We coordinate joint funding of applications. Uh, we're, we're currently in the middle of developing a microbiome review panel with CSR so that microbiome-centric applications can be reviewed by a review panel that is made up of microbiome experts. Uh, we organize NIH-wide workshops and meetings, and we serve as a central resource. We realize NIH is a big place. Microbiome is a young field. It's hard to figure out where to go and who to talk to about getting microbiome research support. And so I would like all of you in this room to copy down this link, because this link is, is gold. I'll tell you why it's gold. You have a key point of contact for each IC that's supporting microbiome research. So let me give you an example. Um, uh, NCATS, I just picked the second one below me, PJ Brooks. He may not be uh, handling all the microbiome FOAs, but he's agreed to be the point person for NCATS. That's true for all the 18 ICs here, okay? That will save you hours of work trying to figure out which program director to talk to. So uh, I would recommend that you write this, this down. So we have the TMWG, which is active for the last five years, four years, and will remain active. Um, another good piece of information, I don't think Scott Jackson's in the room. Um, we recently held a NIST NIH workshop 
to develop standards for microbiome measurements. This, that's been happening kind of at a grassroots level, um, but we just held this two-day workshop um, at NIST headquarters. The webcast for all the talks are here, and it was primarily based on trying to figure out what reference data sets, standards, uh, standard protocols, and so on is needed for DNA analysis, but this is supposed to be one in a series of workshops as we address each kind of analysis that's commonly done in the microbiome. So next we'll, we'll tackle RNA analysis, after that we'll tackle metabolomics and so on, okay? And um, the, the uh, workshop participants and the speakers are currently writing up a special issue, writing up all the talks in BME standards and genomic sciences, probably coming out next year. Um, that's another resource to be aware of as be able to reference standards. And then finally, I think this is my last slide, I mentioned the TMWG, okay? Um, in 2013, we held a three-day workshop uh, and looking across the NIH, what are the gaps, needs, and challenges for advancing the field? And we felt like it was time to kind of take stock at the end of HMP. What do we still need for the field? Um, we're holding a workshop August 16 through 18 on NIH campus. Uh, we've just about finalized the program. We're going to have 40 speakers and about 500 participants. It will be. Um, invitation only because there's a maximum uh, room size where we're holding it. And the idea behind this is to be able to really assess 10 years down the road from the HMP, what are the major gaps, needs, and challenges that we need to, to really help the field uh, mature, stabilize, and move forward. And of course, this will get published too. I'm pretty sure that's my last slide. Yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs>